Okay, picking right up, welcome to part two. So skipping ahead a bit, you can tell there's maybe something like two world wars in the middle, right, between these, uh, going all the way up to about the 1960s, right, which is when this uh, Glen Canyon Dam at Lake Powell would have been completed. Uh, for those of us who are geologists, or geology enthusiasts, um, there's a lot of great stuff to look at back here. Parallel bedding in the sandstone, some massive stuff, cool stuff. Anyway, um, so this is where there is this sort of dawning awareness, right, and realization of environmental issues and their importance. Um, we tend to be much more aware now, and I'm including us in this group of modernity than we were before, despite, I don't know, maybe living in nature, right, living closer to the natural world before, and why is that? So there's an awareness, right, and a realization that a lot of the bad effects are related to the environment. And part of it, again, is related to this interconnectedness of global networks. So what happens in one place now affects the entire world. Um, you have a situation where extreme events all of a sudden can impact the entire planet, right? Instead of just segments of it. Um, sheer population size and scale, right? So there are many more people alive now than at previous times because that is an exponential growth curve. Um, it goes up exponentially over time. So changes in attitudes and what kind of attitudes, attitudes about the relationship between humanity and the natural world. So in a, a previous world, a previous way of thinking, there was this idea that it was sort of humanity's mission or even their duty and responsibility to go out and uh, conquer as much of the natural world as possible and that they had to control it. That was their almost divine mission, right? Was to try to subdue and conquer and control the natural world as best they could, right? And <clears throat> all this language, especially through uh, the history of the American West and Southwest, about uh, going out and, you know, making it livable as though it needed to be controlled and changed. And a lot of the reclamation projects follow from that idea, right? Uh, Post-war cooperation and global commerce. So there has not been another major war since that time. Uh, commerce, right? We have an increasing global trade, uh, things moving around the entire world, and relatedly, an awareness of the effects of that. And this can also lead us to this sort of bigger discussion about growth, right? Good or bad. This is an idea that really was present either way, all, all the way back into the 1960s and 70s, and which has only become more prominent over time. There's a lot of early environmental advocates who were reluctant to necessarily share their views because they didn't want to be branded as anti-growth somehow. And we will see eventually why there really isn't truly a tension between taking care of the environment and growing, how failing to do one will eventually stop you from being able to do the other. Um, so moving into the 1980s and 90s, right, we start to get more serious. Um, I included this uh, also as an example of an environmental issue that is big today and also because the uh, 1970s would have been I guess the coming of age of the Sierra Club and related organizations who fought really, really hard against some of these projects. Some of them they won, some of them they gave in. This was a situation where they gave in and maybe it would be better if they didn't, if we didn't have that damn to worry about. Um, so there is more of an understanding moving closer to the present day that environment and the economy are not altogether different, right? So the resource base for the economy comes from the environment. Environment provides things that you can't necessarily buy or can't do otherwise. Uh, this awareness of the ecological footprint concept, right? That you can quantify sustainability and put it to a number. So that is why I included uh, this shot here. Um, there is a website, I'll include it in a note, maybe I don't remember what it is, something like Footprint Calculator. You go in and you talk about your habits and lifestyle and where you live and how you live. And essentially it calculates out, right? So for somebody to live the way you do, there has to be this X number of you know, acres or really hectares of land that are set aside to provide the resources for you and to handle your waste. So this was not my result. I think mine was slightly lower, right? But I would expect most people in my classes and most Americans in general to get a number that is somewhere like this, right? In other words, the world cannot physically sustain everybody living the way that those of us do here in the States. Physically, biological cannot support it. So there's a survey question that I ask, right? You know, 
the society we live in is unsustainable, true or false, you can pretty much quantifiably say that it is unsustainable. Uh, we have the emergence of other sustainability concepts. So climate change, which to be clear, the mechanisms behind it were proposed and were something that people were aware of for a long time before this, 70 to 100 years before. But this is when it started to gain prominence and become widespread of overfishing, particularly places in East Asia, South Asia, and West uh, coast of Europe overall, of land degradation by erosion, which again is not necessarily a new issue, but this is the first time that there's these coordinated efforts, public policy programs, environmental legislation in the EPA to sort of try to get this under control, right? Not just see that it was happening, but to try to do something about it. Uh, we have a mass extinction crisis and loss of biodiversity. Uh, we get more details on this later on, but this is something that continues to get worse and not better. And uh, finally, we can move into the present day, right? So I've hit on connectivity many times, and we will see precisely why that's so important when it comes to changing these relationships between people and changing the effects that happen in the world and changing those big three things. Maybe we remember them now, right? War, infectious disease, and environmental issues. So you want to talk about things where the connectedness of the world leads extreme events and outsize events to have outsized impact in a way that they couldn't before. Interconnectedness is the thing, right? It's the reason. Even a small change in the degree of connectivity in the world can lead to massively different impacts of things like disease, right? I mean, in this day and age, you could have everybody in the entire world infected over the course of a weekend. Yeah. So present day, right? We have widespread awareness of a lot of these issues, environmental issues, climate change, these continued tensions between current needs and future needs, right? And conflicting incentives and really difficult to evaluate and act situations about how much people's lives are worth now compared to in the future. Uh, we start running into the limits of science to be able to solve non-scientific problems. So very important for us to understand what science is, what it can do, and also what it isn't, what it cannot do. Many areas where the science is extremely clear and where, you know, inside the, the universe of serious, knowledgeable people, there's not disagreement. But does that necessarily lead to solving problems? No. And in many ways, the scientific problems end up being more straightforward than the societal problems. So, uh, Use of deceptive marketing and branding practices, aka greenwashing, and the difficulties in being able to compare data that you get between companies and figure out whether they are who they say they are. Um, increased alienation and isolation, which is ironic considering this, right? Uh, atomization is the term I hear a lot. Um, unprecedented levels of interconnectedness at all scales and whole scale transformation of human social networks and the consequences that that is bringing. Um, so that is going to be it for section two on the history of the environment crash course. Uh, for the next one, we're going to get a little bit more abstract. It's going to be interesting though. Stay tuned.